thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for coming. Um, and I'd also like to express my thanks to the Bureau of Ethics Congress for uh, inviting us to present. I'm presenting this material on behalf of our research group, uh, who I will acknowledge uh, in the last slide. And if I don't, don't put my glasses on, I can't see anything. Um, so this work is, uh, is early stage sort of proof of concept work. So um, I realise that I'm the only person standing between you and lunch, and so I'm going to be hopefully brief and gentle, and then we'll all go to lunch together, okay? And I'm trying to work two screens, which is stupid. Uh, so I come from Australia, um, and for those of you who don't know, there's Sapporo, and I come from Melbourne, so we're 9,000 kilometres due south. Uh, thankfully, we're in the same, pretty much the same time zone as Sapporo, this is, I think, the first international conference I've been to where I have not changed time zone and I'm not jet lagged. And I'm really happy about that. Um, and for some of you, I've had conversations with some of you uh, during breaks. Uh, I'd just like to clarify, Australia is a separate country to New Zealand, okay? <laughs> we are the big island. They're down there near the South Pole. So to give you some context of the talk, um, because you don't all know where Australia is, um, the Australian dairy industry uh, consists of about one and a half million cows. It's uh, concentrated in Victoria, my home state, so about two thirds of the Australian dairy industry is down in this part of the country. There's a little bit over here, there's a little bit over here, um, a bit here, some up the coast and some up there. This is desert. Uh, we have about f uh, just under 6,000 herds. The average size is 260 cows per herd or thereabouts. Um, the vast majority of herds are family owned and operated. Uh, typically 5,800 litres per cow per year uh, using a pasture feed base uh, with on average about one and a half tonnes or thereabouts of uh, supplements, grain and concentrates fed on top of the pasture. Uh, we carve predominantly in spring, so our spring, Southern Hemisphere spring, which is about now, um, but there is a shift towards, uh, more towards uh, autumn carving uh, in some parts of the country. We are a significant export industry for our country, uh, about $3.7 billion, which is a lot of money, um, and the vast majority of that is exported. No, not the vast majority, we are an export industry. So mycoplasma, um, mycoplasma is an important pathogen of dairy herds. Uh, in young cattle, in young calves, it causes pneumonia, it causes arthritis, and it can cause uh, otitis. Uh, in adult dairy cows, you see mastitis, you see pneumonia, and you can see arthritis. The detection of mycoplasma bovis is a little bit tricky. Um, routine techniques can be uh, difficult and can be a little bit unreliable. Culture of mycoplasma uh, is difficult because the media that laboratories use for mastitis pathogens often does not grow uh, mycoplasma. So they're looking for gram positives, gram negatives, staphs and streps, and a lot of labs won't be testing routinely for mycoplasma. Um, PCR, there are PCR techniques around for mycoplasma. Uh, they are very sensitive, there's no question about that, but they don't, uh, they haven't all been validated for uh, local strains of mycoplasma, and they are not always very specific, and I'll, I'll get back to that in a later slide. They do have the advantage of, uh, because they're so sensitive, of being uh, usable on bulk tanks. Uh, serological testing for mycoplasma is possible, it indicates exposure, um, but you have to go out and bleed cows, and bleed a lot of cows, and that takes a lot of time and subsequently can be quite uh, expensive. So uh, our work was to try and come up with a, a, a different way of, of getting a handle on how much mycoplasma bovis there is in Australia. 
So uh, we were, we've been doing some work with bobby calves. Now, I'm not sure this terminology is consistent the world around, but a bobby calf is a male dairy calf that is sold for slaughter. Uh, our regulations say uh, cannot be sent off farm less than five days, uh, but generally these calves are um, five to 30 days old. They are removed from their mothers at a day of age or whatever, fed milk on farm, and then trucked to the abattoir as fast as the farmer can get rid of them. And they go for slaughter. And in Australia, um, in Victoria, there's probably something like half a million dairy calves go to slaughter like that every year. Um, that's very sad, but uh, those calves do represent a, a great resource in the way of monitoring herds uh, because post-slaughter sampling of bobby calves is really easy and really fast. The calves come in, uh, they're stunned, they're hung up, their throats are slit, they bleed out, you stand there with a tube and catch the blood. Um, it's not nice, but it's very, uh, it's very easy. Uh, it doesn't involve any individual animal handling, so we're doing this post-slaughter. So we're not, taking, we're not having to muck around doing venipuncture uh, of calves pre-slaughter. It's all post-slaughter. So um, that has some advantages. And we have uh, in Australia a, a national livestock identification scheme uh, which involves uh, electronic ID ear tags which have to be put into the ears of all cattle on farm, including bobby calves. So they are electronically identified and using a, a wand we can read the electronic ID of these calves as they go past us on the killing line and we can then go back and, and interrogate the database uh, to uh, ascertain the property of origin of those calves. So our study, um, so again, just in case you've forgotten what Australia looks like, this is us, here we are down here, here's Tasmania, here are penguins down here, South Pole. 327 calves, mostly male calves, not all. Um, there are some female calves, heifer calves, which are sent for slaughter for whatever reason. We don't know why. Um, but m the vast majority of calves that went through in our study were male. Uh, legally, they have to be more than five days of age. Uh, we don't have data on how old they are, but farmers, dairy farmers are trying to get rid of them as soon as possible. Uh, my educated guess is that they are all probably between 5 and 14 days of age, something like that. We sampled uh, a single abattoir on eight sampling days uh, between September 2015 and April 2016. And the, uh, so the calves come in on trucks, they are held in lairage at the abattoirs, they are then uh, put up the, the, the ramp, stunned, there is no order to how the calves are put through, so we just sample the calves as they come on the line. So uh, we can't select the calves, all we can do is work as fast as possible, which means that we sample about every fourth or fifth calf uh, as it's going through post-slaughter. So what that meant was uh, when we went back through the data, uh, the 327 calves that we sampled came from 166 herds, uh, all of which were uh, so the, the abattoir is actually in, in Geelong, just south of Melbourne. Uh, all of the herds that we were sampling were from the northern dairy area of Victoria, which is up here. Um, so the, the abattoir is here. So these calves get put on trucks and driven south, about 300 kilometres. Or calves over here in Gippsland, the southeastern dairy area, that get put on trucks and driven through the city of Melbourne and down to Geelong. And when we went in and interrogated the uh, NLIS database, ear tags, the 327 calves came from 166 herds. We had a lot of herds where we only had one calf from the herd. We had uh, some where there were two or three, and I think the most calves we had from a, an individual herd was about nine or 10. Um, so having collected the samples, um, the blood samples from free catch, uh, we analyzed, we spun them down uh, and analyzed them using an ELISA. This is an ELISA uh, which was developed by my colleagues um, uh, Nadika Wawagama, uh, who has published uh, both the, the setup and the validation process for this ELISA. 
Um, uh, I was not involved in this work, um, but I would recommend, and I'm quite happy to, to give you this information later on to, uh, for you to go back and look at the, the data to see how it was uh, developed and, and validated. So the results. Uh, out, of 100, uh, out of the 327 calves that we uh, sampled, 166 herds, uh, at uh, 51 herds had at least one uh, positive calf for M. bovis uh, on antibody. Antibodies, calves are born without their own antibodies, um, so the antibodies uh, in their serum have come from maternal antibodies, uh, which is a reflection of the milk uh, that those calves are being fed. Um, so this is an indirect indicator of Mycoplasma bovis exposure in the herds of origin for these calves. Um, we don't know anything about the feeding practices of these herds, um, which is a limitation of the study. Um, but these calves, because they were so young, uh, if there are antibodies to the calves, uh, antibodies to Mycoplasma in the calves when we tested them, uh, they've got them from the herds of origin. There is the small complication of, uh, of how to interpret these results with failure of passive transfer. Uh, this was part of a broader study and uh, quite a few, uh, off the top of my head, about 25% of these calves, there was evidence of failure of passive transfer. Um, and so if a calf has not suckled or has not had adequate colostrum on the property of origin, then clearly their chances of of getting mycoplasma antibodies from their mothers or from the milk are decreased. So negatives are a little bit hard to interpret. Positives are uh, very strong evidence that they've come from a herd where mycoplasma is, is uh, circulating. As such, uh, because of our sampling, because of the problem of failure of trans passive transfer, um, I think it's fair to say that our, uh, our estimate of uh, Mycoplasma bovis is an underestimate uh, in Australian dairy herds. Um, I don't know what the magic prevalence number is, but I've got a good idea of how low, uh, what the minimum is. We have these limitations. We only sampled uh, 166 herds. Uh, as I said, there's nearly 6,000 herds in Australia. Uh, we only sampled 166 herds. Those herds were from two of the major dairy areas in Australia. So uh, that, that gives me some confidence. We only sampled a few calves, but if I've got antibodies to mycoplasma in a couple of calves, then uh, that's evidence of the herd. And as I said, a lack of knowledge about the individual herds. We, we weren't able to go back to the herds of origin, uh, so we were not able to retrospectively go back and ask questions of these farmers. Uh, mycoplasma is likely to be more common in Australian dairy herds than previously reported. There's a number of studies uh, which go back uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, there were a couple of studies some time ago which suggested that uh, mycoplasma was rampant in Australia. I think that was a, uh, an indication of the lack of specificity of their test. There have been more recent tests, uh, reports with PCR, which um, suggest that there's hardly any mycoplasma in Australia, and I think there are some limitations to those studies as well. Uh, our study suggests that it's the Goldilocks principle. There's not a lot, there's none, there's, it's just right. It's just in the, in the middle. So the key points for you to remember. Sampling uh, calf serum at abattoirs is easy. Uh, it assesses herd exposure status. It allows efficient sampling of multiple herds. It's just not very nice to do. Uh, the first point on a killing line in a calf abattoir is not a nice place to be. You stand there getting covered in blood and faeces. And some of our students find it very, very confronting. Uh, NLIS provides useful traceability to a herd of origin. Uh, I'll, I'll say that I find it a little frustrating how hard it is to get information out of that database, but it's there. And uh, the, the fundamental is that Mycoplasma bovis, uh, we think, is probably quite common in Australian dairy herds and much more common than some people think. I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, Manoa Palab, who's sitting down there. Um, so Manoa is our postgraduate student and he's done most of the work, so if you want to ask uh, any really difficult questions, 
uh, Mona is the man to ask. If you've got any really easy questions, come to me. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Chittagong Veterinary and Animal uh, Sciences University, which is where Monoa comes from, and the Australian Government's Endeavour Scholarship and Fellowships Program, who support him, and our colleagues, Dr Nadika Wawagama, Professor Glenn Browning, and Professor Andrew Fisher. And with that, I will thank you for your attention, invite you all to lunch, and say every Japanese word I know, which is arigato.